All right, <laughs> to start with, thank you very much, Ben and crew, for having me. I'm very appreciative and I love what Naham Khan has become. It's a very exciting conference and it's such a, an honor to be amongst the lineup that you selected this year. Thank you again. Um, this talk is going to expand a bit. Uh, firstly, <laughs> hi for those of you that don't know me, I'm Michael. I commonly go by Kadingo and I make educational content on YouTube, mostly around the bug bounty space with an emphasis on tooling. Um, and in my day job, I'm the Senior Director of Security Operations for Bug Crowd. I run the triage team, a um, couple of other teams there that we'll talk about in the future that are around the standardization of bug bounties. But the part I want to talk to you about today is an expansion on a previous talk I did on recon fundamentals. And in that talk, I introduced two concepts. The cataloging of tools, you know, are they doing wide level recon? or narrow level recon? And are they active or are they passive? And I think it's important to use these terms more frequently to not just talk about everything as recon, because a recon tool can have a variety of intents. It can be something that touches an asset, you need to be aware of that, or it can be something that doesn't, and it's just using OSINT sources, and it's great to be understanding of that as well. So we'll kick off with some examples of that to further elaborate on that concept and touch on that concept more. And then from there, I'd like to show off some of the recent tooling that I think is pretty exciting in this space. So Kaido, Truffle Hog, and already released, but also still reasonably recent Security Trails SQL Explorer engine and how those are exciting me, how they kind of relate back to this concept and why I think you need to have them on your roadmap for the future. So without further ado, thank you again for having me and let's cut into it. I just recorded this and I forgot to hit start recording. There's no bigger frustration <laughs> as a creator. Um, let's do round two. Well, basically, I wanted to quickly retouch on what my previous talk covered. Um, you can find this in both written and, for uh, written and video format to consume after this if you'd like. Um, the two things that I introduced were narrow and wide. Wide level recon is when you're doing what's commonly coined up today as attack surface mapping. You're understanding what are the pieces that make up this organization? Uh, what are their, what's their domain space look like and things like that. Narrow is when you start digging into an asset. So you might pick a web application and start doing directory brute forcing and things like that. You're still doing recon and you're still mapping out the application, but you're now in the recon phase where you're narrowly honing in on a target. Further from that, we've got active testing and passive testing. Passive testing is when you're using an intermediary or doing something that's not going to actually send a request to your target. You're using GitHub to look for credentials or API keys, using a tool like Trufflehog, it's going up and doing that for you all manually. You're using OSINT sources like security trails, Woxy and other things to capture data that they've already captured when they've done active testing then you're not as concerned with a program's brief on rate limiting then because you're not actually touching the program. You're using intermediaries and third parties. However, once you move into the active phase, that's when you're sending requests to the target. So you're going through Kaido or Burp Suite or Zap Proxy, you're sending requests, or maybe you're using FFUF and you're directory brute forcing. All of these things are actively on the target. And that's the defining difference is when you're looking at a tool is this something where I need to go to the brief, I need to understand what I'm, what I'm testing, or I need to consider as a red team operator, you know, what are the impacts on the application? Am I gonna fire off some alerts I don't wanna fire? Um, or is this a more passive tool? So we'll break down some tools, we'll put them into some categories, understanding that this isn't binary, a tool can be both active and passive. Um, we'll cover that in the next block. All right, so let's talk about some tools and whether they're active, passive, narrow, or wide. Um, mostly because it's very easy once you start to use these terms to start to put things into a single box and not realize that they're descriptors for the behavior, but tools can have multiple behaviors associated with them. So let's take Subfinder and Amass, for example. They're both active and passive tools. They can passively crawl external OSINT data sources for you, collect a range of information, but they also have active modes in them that will touch a target, touch logs and things like that. In terms of the defining difference between the two, Subfinder and carrying a bias here because I was in this team in the beginning, but Subfinder was developed with the entirety of an intent to be passive from the beginning. The entire design flow, the pattern of the program is to be passive unless you force active modes to happen. Where a mass added um, 
passive as a defining feature into the application much later in the development process. How well that's done, I can't fairly say without spending a lot of time looking, but I can say I'm confident that when I use Subfinder and I'm using it passively, that it is doing just that. Um, and that's not to say one is better than the other. These days, the distinction is very narrow and it's very much down to personal preference. So I'm not casting a bias here. I, I do believe that you should be very familiar with both in the current day. Um, other tools that are a bit more active and a bit more narrow in testing tend to be when you're using a proxy such as Kaido or Burp Suite or Zap Proxy. When you're using those tools, you're typically narrowing on an, in on a target and you're doing active testing. You're testing for SQL injection using you know, manual techniques or you're brute force testing. You're doing things on a target that are going to create log entries and you're narrowly looking at a target, typically speaking, you're not looking at a range of targets from a wide stance. But then some other tools that do similar behaviors such as FFUF sit a bit more in the middle. A lot of people would use FFUF for narrow level testing, so brute forcing, but you can use it for wide active testing. So you can pass it a range of domains, do wide level testing with brute forcing. So you could take a directory and test that directory over a thousand assets. That's wide testing actively because it's creating logs. And you'll see there's this common theme and behavior coming out. Typically speaking, active testing is something that's going to create a log entry. You're touching a company's asset directly. You're not looking at GitHub. You're not just looking at external OSINT data sources for sources. You're doing something that touches a web server. And the difference between narrow and wide, wide, you're looking at a collection. You're looking at the range of the organization and you're identifying then where you want to go narrow, which is when you're picking a target and you're really diving into it. So tools can do both. And it's important not to simply catalog something, but it is important to understand the intent of what a tool is doing. So when you get to engagements where you don't want to create a lot of noise, which can happen in your career, or if you want to limit the number of requests you're sending, things like that, you understand, is this limiting to an OSINT data source and it's going outside of the defined scope to collect me assets? Or is this something I need to limit because it's going directly to the target itself? It's one of the reasons it's important to start thinking about this and how it applies to the products that you're using. All right, so <laughs> I'm really rusty in front of this camera. It's so much easier um, when you're doing it regularly. Let's try this again. I'd like to cover not just how to catalog tools and techniques. I think that's a useful thing and, and part of why I've front loaded this talk with, hey, let's understand how to think about what's touching an asset and what's not. We should also cover some of the exciting new tooling that's coming up in both an active and a passive lens and how that relates to current testing thinking and why I'm kind of excited by it. Uh, TruffleSec's new Truffle Hog um, is amazing. It's a gem. It's got so many checks and it has thought through the active side of its checks uh, in a very safe manner. So it does active testing uh, with what it finds passively on GitHub, but it very safely verifies that. It won't cause risk to a customer. So you can think about that as a both passive and active tool, but safe to use on environments um, with consideration. If you're on a red team engagement, you may not want to um, have it checking things directly, which you can do in the tool. Um, the next one that's really exciting me is Kaido. It presents a whole new way of thinking about the proxy innovation that we've sorely needed in this space for a long time, um, allowing you to do your active testing in a way that can easily be tracked. If you're a bug bounty hunter or a pen tester, even you know doing some sort of blue team and you're breaking things down with a proxy, you can run it now in a remote red box. You can log everything there. I can start my testing on this machine and I can go in a, through an SSH session pick it up on my laptop, go sit on the deck and keep testing. I've done that and I love that flow. So I really want to cover why Kaido excites me. And lastly, the one that we'll start with now is security trails. And the reason security trails excites me is it's been really well integrated now into Subfinder, into a mass, and Hacklick's done a really good job with a tool called Hack Trails. But I still believe there's distinct advantage that you get when you use it directly. And I'd like to provide you an example of how I do that when I'm poking at a target to really give me deep insights into something. And it's almost like manually testing the passive perimeter in a way that allows me to get my cre creative juices going and really hit flow state on recon um, in a way that no other tool's really done for me on the command line when I'm doing a recon phase from an external perimeter. So 
wide recon, um, but in a way that you can be really creative with it. So I'd like to start there and, and hopefully get others as excited about it as I am. All right, <laughs> this is a hard one to really talk about because I think it really comes down to the creativity you want to bring to play. Um, tooling consumes security trails data really well and Luke, uh, Hack Luke that is, has done a really good job in Hack Trails of making that useful on the command line. Why I feel this is a useful accoutrement to that, I still use Hack Trails. I use a lot of Luke's tools. I find them very good. Um, Tom Nom Nom, Hack Luke, they're very good authors to just go and look at all the things they're building. Lots of utilities there. Um, why I think this is good is because if you're hunting and you're in a wide recon phase, the ability to get creative and to start to think about your target is often the defining difference between feeling inspired to hack and feeling a bit not numb to the process, but you don't hit flow state as easily, it becomes more routine. And I find using a tool like this lets me be creative. So let's use an example um, that I came across recently. Um, Bigcommerce.net. Um, we're doing not everything completely passive. There's no findings here. This is all completely legal and fine. Um, if I pop this into security trails as a generic return, you can see, look, there's some reverse DNS here that's giving me domains. There's some subdomains, but for the most part, the de domains themselves have email level protection. Um, if we go into it on who is, and I, sh I can always do this on the command line too. Usually I'll pair up the command line with it. So you can see, look, there's email level protection um, and the organization is showing is not available. As I explored, I ended up thinking, okay, well, what happens if in the past there's been other fields where it's been exposed before it was uh, protected or anything like that? And what I stumbled across was that there were a series of domains where there was email level protection, but the organization for the provider they were using for who is protection was still out in the clear as um, big commerce. So by playing around in the SQL engine, which you see here, and this is the part that I really feel that creativity comes to play. Um, you know, you can see here, I can look at information about SSL certificates, current and historical, the apex domains, the subdomains, uh, redirects that might be in place, name servers. There's a whole host of things relating to the apex domain that I can start to tease out and explore. By doing that here, I found a way to retrieve a whole host of domains that otherwise wouldn't have come into um, play. So you can see, you know, it said it had 33 domains and I'm not sure if it tells me here the results. There's 90 results there. And I extended that work further. I took some of these domains. I looked at other elements of it. So you can see there's somewhere in here, bigcommerce.com versus bigcommerce.net. So I started to explore the extensions of bigcommerce.com and things like that, ultimately giving me a pretty large result set that extended well upon what a mass uh, Subfinder and others were able to provide me with. And there's a reason for that. It's not that authors have made a mistake. Nobody's actually um, made a mistake. They've really worked on these tools hard to make them as extensive as possible. But whenever you write anything that has to apply over a large range of assets, you can't possibly cater for every single edge case. And in doing so, something that's a little bit more niche that you can find by doing manual exploration of a database like this isn't necessarily going to be catered for in the tooling because it might in you know one in a hundred times be useful information and 99 times out of 100 be junk and not return anything so project discovery with subfinder are going to focus on the accuracy over you know what could be 99 percent noise so it's for me at least been a really valuable tool to start to dig into um queries that I've crafted. I've, I've got a number of things that I've, I've come up with that I use regularly to start on targets. Um, and then I'll, you can download those results, I'll merge them and I'll start putting them in my notes and I'll verify whether there is an attribution there or if I'm on a bit of a, a false herring because there is that too. You know, some of these could be junk. Um, but equally, you know, the acquisition information in there tends to be uh, a bit of an extension on Crunchbase. I don't know exactly how they've done it, but um, I'll usually put Crunchbase on this together and I'll get more acquisition information, take that to the SQL engine and really explore and expand on it further. Um, I believe um, 
Patrick um, has done a really good job of covering this. I'll try and find the video in post. In, in the moment, I can't recall if he's ever published it, but I, I do believe he's done a talk at prior NahumCon potentially about security trials specifically. Um, and I'm sure there's other works out there that you could find, but I really wanted to touch on, this is reasonably new. It's only the last year and the last six months when the SQL engines come in that it's shown its true strength and security trials have really stepped up um, they are now quiet. I'd like to see where that goes and hope that that means more powerful things. But largely, they also engage heavily with the community in their Slack, running events to build out their data set, bounty style competitions for that. Um, and they've been very receptive to feedback around this engine, um, either for feature improvements or potential deficiencies, things like that. They're, any Anyone that talks to community tends to thrive in this space because the community is very willing to bring forward good ideas openly and they make the most of that so i'd encourage you take a shot at playing around with security trials not just in your tools but if you uh, can afford it there is a cost associated with that if you can afford it take a poke around the sql engine this isn't sponsored content for disclosure they have given me codes to give away in my videos before which i've been doing um, but this isn't uh, in any way a paid endorsement or anything like that i just love the product it's made me money in my bounties and um, I hope that's coming through in the passion that I've got for it because uh, good work deserves good praise. So next, let's talk about Kaido. Now, it's still in beta and it's still a private beta. They're adding people progressively and I really thank the team for giving myself and others a chance to start to use it and provide in input. Um, they're really, really rapid to implement, in implement things and it feels like the community's come back to the proxy. They talk with us, they do releases, and they're really trying to make the product that people want to use. It's not written in Java, it's lightweight, and it's portable. And the fantastic thing about that is as a tester, you really want your tools to get out of the way, throw them up on a VPS, and it avoids you having to uh, deal with things like Akamai bands on the home network and getting everyone booted from Epa sites and things like that. And now I completely accept that with Burp Suite and Zap, that's solvable. With Burp Suite, you can run a SOX proxy to a VPS and tunnel your traf traffic out that way. That doesn't solve the fact that I need to sit on, you know, 64 gig of RAM and a really heavy instance. I just want something lightweight on the fly. I want my proxy to get out of the way and let me focus on the core of what I'm doing. And Kaido's come to the table with that. You run a binary, you use your web browser and you interact with the proxy. And why that's so cool is they're supporting all manner of systems and I can put that binary on my VPS and SSH tunnel back the web port and use my proxy locally whilst exiting my traffic out of the VPS. So I can do some really exciting testing that way without having it locally, even though I'm interacting with it locally. So I can do things like uh, test on my desktop, using the VPS and then resume it later. And now that's great for my workflow. That suits me really well. It's made, it's made everything quite portable. I can put my VPS in a location close to my target. I'm in Australia. So putting some, a VPS in San Francisco tends to get me better returns to a target. Um, or if I'm testing something that's got localized conditions, like, hey, this is only available to people in India, I can throw a VPS there and I can, I can do it that way. Um, admittedly, I haven't dealt with that use case yet. I've not been tested very long, but that would satisfy that condition versus using a VPN or something like that. Um, shout out to ProtonMail VPN if you ever need a lot of regions quickly. That's a really good way to get a, a ton of regions very fast. Um, <laughs> back to where I was at. So the reason I find this quite um, an exciting approach is for pen testing firms, you can also now have your proxy directly on the red box. So in my time with pen testing, the red box has always been the exit point and you'd use burp suite with a socks proxy there and then at the end of the engagement you would take your proxy logs and you would upload it and that would be how you'd retain engagement history for the long term and that's important because you know three six months from now a client could come back they could have an incident and the company needs to be able to check the pen test company needs to be able to check what happened and why it happened the real benefit behind Kaido is now everything can be contained to your red box for the engagement. It stores project files and you can have your project files retained there in a means that it doesn't touch the tester's local instance. Everything's sitting in your remote red box and everything's contained, which also solves the core problem that you would have in pen testing of 
everybody forgets to upload their burp suite files and there's this constant regular nagging to make sure that project files are stored up it's this whole rigmarole and if someone's left the company and a company comes back often the pen test firm's not going to have those files that's a pretty common problem that happens so kaido taking these new approaches not only makes it so much more elegant for me as a bug bounty tester but as a penetration tester i now have more control over my environment and you know a more clean way of structuring all of my logging and testing around an asset. If you're a bug bounty hunter, you could even say, have your projects organized there, pick up a target, resume it, and use that as a long-term log storage instead of having to copy everything around the place. This isn't an advertisement. This isn't paid. I just am really excited about this product, and I struggle these days to get that level of excitement about something new. It is it is uh, really groundbreaking and really interesting to see uh, that not only has someone come into the proxy space and disrupted it, but they've disrupted it by really solving core problems um, that have sat on the table for years and no one's touched. So it's great to see uh, that kind of innovation moving forward. So I was originally going to round things out covering Truffle because it really excites me. I, I, I was privileged enough to get early access to that. Thank you, Dylan and crew. That's amazing. Um, I do have future content coming up on that where I'll go deeper, but... I didn't see the reason to do it here, mostly because Dylan Avery is doing a talk at NahumCon, which is amazing. Um, and NahumSec himself has also put out really awesome content at that. So I'd really encourage you, I don't know if it's before this or and you've got to catch him recording or if it's after this, catch Dylan's talk. I've been chatting to him this week and I know he's putting a lot of effort in. I've also heard from Ben, like he's really excited about that talk and um, what better way to learn about it than from the creator themselves. And uh, for Ben... He's done a really good uh, video on this where he goes deep already. The part I'll add, the thing that excites me is from a bug crap perspective, <clears throat> the things that cause incidents with customers are things that uh, cause a negative disruption. And um, key hacks has been a great way of cataloging keys and ways to test them. But sometimes people you know, look for ways to test them that cause incidents and cause calls with customers and other incidents that... Um, they add overhead and they can make it, you know, people still get paid and it just, it makes it more elongated to get to that point because we've now got to talk to the customer and explain, you know, how this process happened. Trufflehog, I think, is going to solve a lot of that. It, it adds a lot of safe means of testing keys. They put a lot of thought and a lot of effort for the hundreds of keys that they're gathering up to make sure they're testing them in a way that won't cause a production disruption. So the director in me is excited by that and what that means it's, it's innovation for the bug bounty space that i think normally would go unnoticed but i wanted to kind of paint a target on it and say look this is awesome they've received funding they've put it to the best benefit they could for the community and created an awesome tool but they've also designed it in a way that works in a corporate environment that's exciting for any tool that means you can learn it and then take it into a day job as a pen tester and not be worried about a negative outcome. So I really encourage you to learn more about Truffle Hog. Um, it's new, but it is the best way now, without question, to discover API keys and credentials um, that are sitting out there in OSINT when you're doing your wide level recon and uh, know whether you have a valid finding or not, because it, it will also help highlight, hey, this is a test key that's no longer in use and things like that. So catch that. And all of that said, um, this is the end of my talk. I, I'm very, very grateful uh, to anyone who's listened this far. Thank you very much. I hope to catch you on YouTube or Twitter. Um, come find me and I'd be happy to answer any questions you have there that don't get answered at the end of this or that you, you know, come up with if you're watching this in post in a recording. Thank you again. Cheers.